and welcome to uh, the fourth installment? Four. Episode, fourth episode four. Episode four of uh, our now ongoing uh, FOIA side chats. Uh, I'm J. Patrick Brown, editor at Monk Rock, and I am joined here by... I'm Nicole, I'm an intern. Uh, and I'm Sean, the projects editor. Uh, and today we're going to have uh, a chat by this FOIA um, about uh, the role of archiving in public records requests, I guess that is that. Yeah, I guess FOIA and public records as like as not just a source of breaking news, but also requesting these documents from government agencies uh, before they're destroyed or, or lost uh, kind of forever through routine purging of records and things like that. And uh, I think so. To to start us off, uh, you know, I think uh, this really sort of kicked off. Uh, this week was uh, we got a very interesting FBI file, and that file was um, the FBI file of Christopher Hitchens, um, which had been previously released. Um, and I was interested in requesting it because I saw a few articles about it where the file was linked, but it had been deleted. Um, so so where was you say it was previously released, but where where was that? Where how did you? How did you find that out? And besides, so the article's linked to what? Well, there are actually numerous articles, probably like at least five, but um, there was one small blog um, that the actual file was on, uh, but when I tried to load the page, it would just um, continue loading over and over. Interesting. And another location um, had been deleted. So I also looked in the FBI's vault, um, which is uh, released files, and it wasn't there. So I was I was interested in knowing um, why it had been deleted. Um, and it seems that the file that I got, at least from what I could tell, uh, contained the same material as the others. I was wondering if maybe there would be something that was left out, but as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem there was. It's so. I think when when you first approached us about wanting to, to get this file, I, I think we were generally of the attitude that it was someone had already got it, so it wasn't really worth bothering. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. I had seen. I think a lot of the same articles that you were that you were talking about, where I saw it linked. I saw, it, and I think I had also at one time seen it on the vault because I think that the FBI actually either tweeted it or in some way it was sort of it was announced that uh, this this file or files had been had been released. And in, in the vault for the uninitiated is where the FBI makes publicly available all of its documents that. I think what is it? It hits a certain criteria of X number of people ask for. A certain number of people ask for it. So usually it's celebrities, politicians, historical, uh, just people who but are important. Or, or um, in terms of themes, they put a lot of documents on there that are about uh, surveillance or or other kind of topics of note that a lot of people are interested in. So in a lot of cases, they won't just release it to, to their credit. They won't just release it to the to uh, just the individuals who requested it. And, silo it off and that way they, they'll put it online but in this case it looked like it had been put online but then it had been deleted yes so why I'm interested why were you why, why were you interested in Christopher Hitchens in, in particular well just um, as a journalist I was interested in him but um, also documents like that are important as archival material and I thought that if it had been released before it should be publicly available it, you know, it's interesting that, you know, I, I think we we have to take the FBI at face value when they want, when in these situations where, like, you don't want to be burdensome. To, you, know, you, don't want to, you don't want FOIA to be, like, a punitive or burdensome measure. We do want to ask for things that are worth releasing, and we don't want to put agencies in a position where we make them do work they don't have to do. But I think what you sort of highlighted... Um, and I think Sean, you'll expand upon it a little bit later. Is that um, a lot of cases these agencies, after releasing it, don't really have a long-term plan for keeping it. Um, and you know, a lot of these requests, once they go out, people they get sent to people and then destroyed. And I, I think that uh, you know, I think the the idea that this information is sort of uh, 
a one time, you know, it's almost like a one time use, you know, sort of like you get one look at Christopher Hitchens' file and they close it. Um, and then uh, is, a, I, th I think, um, puts us all in an interesting position in terms of not wanting to be burdensome, but at the same time, want to make sure that there are lasting copies of this information. Yeah, and that's the, that's the great thing <clears throat> that the FBI has done a pretty good job of through, through the vault is putting copies of, of these documents online so that anybody who's interested can do uh, They show up in Google searches pretty routinely uh, that, the, that these documents are available so that you don't have to submit a, du a duplicate request. Um, and that kind of with pre-internet, pre that, op that opportunity didn't exist. You had to go to a central archive. You had to know how to find, find this material by digging through uh, physical boxes. Uh, mm -hmm. So that kind of is one of the best potential uses, both historically and as journalists, uh, to find this material uh, and give it to the public to, to find what they're interested in. I mean, as journalists, we can't kind of we can't point out every interesting thing this file through through just editing. Some of that stuff gets lost, but mm -hmm. now the the raw material is uh, really <laughs> easy to just to to scroll through the actual Christopher Hitchens file, and that's that's great. Uh, having looked through it, is there anything? you found interesting? Um, most of the file is about um, his uh, request for United States citizenship. Um, the, the FBI was also interested in him um, in 1970 when he took on a scholarship and was going to be uh, touring colleges in the United States and they wanted to know his itinerary because he had been associated with socialist organizations when he went when he was in school in the UK um, there was a lot of redaction so there are probably uh, I don't know what what that information was but so a lot of times those redactions will be um, so the, the FBI also does a pretty good job of putting next to with pretty much every redaction what exemption uh, the, that information was expunged for, uh, and in a lot of cases, particularly for people who recently died, uh, that information is, is um, pertains to someone who's still alive. So one of the reasons that we can request FBI files is that more uh, uh dead men have no privacy rights. Uh, but if someone who is who's very much still alive uh, is is mentioned in those in excerpts from those files, um, those people do have privacy rights, and so their their identities uh, have to be kept confidential, except for certain instances where they're a public official, where their role is already, already known. Um, and then obviously FBI is a law enforcement agency, so if any parts of those, um, of those documents indicate law enforcement techniques, that's a really common exemption, and also the identity of informants, if there was any, I'm not sure what type of would be informing on Christopher Hitchens in this case, but the word in, in my file. So. Well, you know, speaking of college radicals, um, <laughs> as I said earlier, this was a big week for us in terms of getting a lot of FBI files. Uh, we got a uh, Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. We found out that Johnny Cash burned down a forest in 1965, yes. uh, which kind of makes me, you know, I need to I need to aim higher um, for my 30s. Um, uh, but I, Sean, you 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 received an FBI file uh, that you had requested what like two years ago? Uh, in November 2012, it, um, when I when I first found out that uh, this that and, and Muck Rock, a lot of times uh, FBI files are one of the first things we encourage people to, to file for because it gives you uh, a kind of an introduction to to FOIA through something that's pretty routine. The FBI's uh, got a very routinized uh, process and so uh, I had uh, went to, uh, I started Muck Rock I think in May or June 2012 uh, and so once I found out that you could request the FBI file of anyone who's no longer alive uh, I kind of I went through Wikipedia looking for people who I, who I thought might be interesting people from uh, left-wing activists right-wing people um, people of note who I thought that the FBI particularly under um, uh, McCarthy and Hoover might have uh, have developed some interesting materials on. So uh, this this week uh, we got Allen Ginsberg, the Munich poet, 
Um, and it was not quite so many pages, actually, as I thought. It was like 90 pages were released. There was one document that the CIA said was still classified, so they couldn't give it to give that one to us. They did indicate that there was another portion of documents that were potentially uh, related to, to Ginsburg, but they, quote, were not in the place they expected them to right. be. Uh, and so they, they kind of, that part of the, of the file was potentially lost. And then some documents were submitted, uh, were already moved over to the National Archives, and so we put in another request for those. So I imagine there were some pretty interesting things in the Ginsburg file. <laughs> Yeah, the um, so as we were, as we put up in um, in our piece, kind of breaking breaking down what's in the file. Most of most of the file comes from a, an investigation that was done in 1965 mm -hmm. when uh, the FBI got wind that that uh, Ginsburg and a couple of other poets were going to Cuba to judge a poetry competition there, um, and so they dug through some some files and they. Uh, Found some indications that that Ginsburg was pro Castro, even though I, I think in, uh, history has kind of vindicated Ginsburg in that in that respect. He was pretty critical of Castro's treatment of uh, gay Cubans um, and a lot of other aspects of the Castro regime. He really didn't appreciate, uh, but uh, that was kind of the motivation for for launching into this investigation that was uh, directed by the New York field office. Um, Particular, I mean, this they, they did more than 50 different informant interviews. They reviewed telephone records, arrest records, um, including things that stretch back like 10 or 15 years. Uh, they looked over some of his poetry. A uh, Powell uh, was was brought in, uh, and then there were a lot of different press clippings that seemed their primary use was to discuss uh, the, or to kind of indicate that, uh, that Ginsburg was, quote, a self-admitted uh, homosexual. Uh, so that was kind of a, a theme that, that ran throughout, was uh, just that he was, he was not a straight person. <laughs> and, you know, not to go too far of a tangent on this, but I think that I, it's interesting when you read, like, FBI files that they tend to not be what you expect them to be, like, things that you would expect. I mean, they're th they're thorough. To the uh, that's part of the reason for an FBI file, but it like it covers a much broader expanse that I think is going to be interesting to con to contrast those files. And this is where I think that the archival value of the files really come into play. Is that this isn't our requesting this is not just for oh look what was interesting about the Allen Ginsberg file um, or the Christopher Hitchens one. Part of it is to reflect a lot of how the FBI's. Uh, motivations and techniques have changed. Mm -hmm. and I said that uh, that the tools available to the FBI in investigating Christopher Hitchens were very different than investigating Allen Ginsberg in the in the sixties. Uh, they went for telephone records and voting records and census and census records um, and specifically along telephones. I'm looking into cell phone tracking and a lot of other very modern technologies that was not there was no such thing as a stingray <laughs> that we know of uh, in in the 60s so they couldn't go for in order to, to look at where has Allen Ginsberg been in the past couple of years they had to talk to people who knew where, where he had been rather than serving a subpoena to uh, whoever uh, whichever company maintains a cell phone I'm not sure if Allen Ginsberg would have a cell phone or if he ever did an interesting thing. Nine, so, 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 97, he could have. I mean, right yeah, right yeah, no, yeah. I mean, who knows? Um, but just the, the techniques that were available, I don't know, did the Christopher Hitchens file indicate um, how, how recent were some, what was the most recent document? I think the most recent document was from the early 80s. Okay. Um, it was a really short file, it was only 19 pages, so I don't think there was a ton of investigation mm -hmm. into him. Yeah, but I think that's going to be the interesting uh, pe the, the people who look at the FBI over over a long range. These files will be interesting for what they are able to show about what what the FBI was able to find for people like Allen Ginsberg, um, yeah, or or Christopher Hitchens. I think that's going to be among the more interesting things long term. Yeah, considering like the, I, I think it's I like the I, I like that you framed it like that because it, you know uh, it's. The FBI has a pretty abysmal track record in terms of accidentally. Your words. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll take responsibility for that one. Um, for losing records or 
having records destroyed. I mean, they lost a huge number of civil rights files. Well, uh, so William S. So William S. Burroughs, um, at the same uh, or a couple of months before I requested uh, Ginsburg's file, I also requested William S. Burroughs, um, who is named in a lot of the Ginsburg files, but uh, and even one informant, uh, you know, kind of identified some letters between. Uh, William S. Burroughs and Allen and Allen Ginsberg I don't, and Allen. Uh, so in these, Allen, yeah, right? so in these in these letters, uh, they were signed Bill and Allen, mm -hmm. and an informant who was in uh, in jail in New York said like said Bill is William S. Burroughs, Allen is Allen Ginsberg. I, it's not clear what context, but that's in the file. Um, and so they were William S. Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg were they a lot of the traveling that that is recounted in Ginsberg's file includes. Burroughs, but when I asked for for Burroughs' file, they said a lot of the, a lot of this material that may have been responsive to your request was destroyed years ago. Um, they didn't even mention uh, the National Archives. I don't I don't believe so. To to your point, mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff is destroyed on a on a regular basis, like not just for people who are notable, but imagine all the people, all of the kind of not Allen Ginsberg or Christopher Hitchens that people wouldn't necessarily think to re request that reflect a lot of the techniques that are being used. I think uh, that was, it was, that on one hand you have this, this, this important archival element of if you leave it to the FBI eventually they will either destroy it, like leave it somewhere it can't be found, or, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of Christopher Hitchens, like sort of just quietly remove it from public sphere and I think that whether, inten I mean, in that whether case, intentional whether intentional or just or like not, it's no longer yeah. deemed important enough to take up the valuable server space uh, right on. and I think there's on that element is important but it's also in terms of keeping tabs on the FBI over time um, well, certainly because if, if while we can rely on them to within reason of you know make sure that this stuff is available uh, it's not it, their goal is not to make their techniques available to us and so that almost becomes something that we're responsible for to find what sort of information they're taking and what techniques they're using to get it. Right, and I mean, in both of these cases, it didn't take litigation to, to do that, yeah. but a lot of a, a lot of the most important cases about techniques uh, were, were found, uh, techniques that the FBI uses were found through requests ex exactly like this, where we, where we uh, saw some offhanded mention of a procedure that a journalist or a researcher had never heard of before, um, and then started digging into that, and it took considerable legal battle to, to, to get those documents, whether it's stingrays or drones, um, then, yeah. Uh, so I guess on a, a closing question, um, who is a person that is alive right now? <laughs> we can't wait to, to that, get their FBI file. That you would like to see the FBI file. They don't have to die. You can get their permission. We could get their we could yeah, get their permission. Thank you for qualifying it that way. Um, I so, so do you have an answer? I'm not sure yet. Uh, so uh, sticking with Ginsburg's uh, <laughs> uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I think would be really interesting. To, so a lot of um, a lot of FBI files, like Johnny Cash, you're mentioning uh, as you were reviewing it, was primarily death threats, and that's mm -hmm. that's been the case for a lot of the, the files that that I've seen. But I mean. Ruth Bader Ginsburg has a career that is, like, she's just touched on so many different facets of legal, of our current legal system, before, before she even got on the bench of the Supreme Court, and I can only imagine the, de the like, the, the horrible the threats, and as well as, it'd be interesting to see what, because uh, in order to become the, a just, <laughs> justice on the Supreme Court, I would hope that there's a pretty rigorous background background check that's involved there, uh, and so it'd be be interesting to see uh, beyond beyond background checks and death threats mm -hmm. to see um, whether through the <laughs> through a lot of this new left uh, kind of investigation whether any of her previous activity ever brought her onto the FBI's radar. I'm not I'm not sure. I haven't really heard of anything like that, but. The, the background checks are interesting. I mean, uh, in uh, I think Steve Jobs, that was one of the, the few okay. really substantive things we that in the FBI file is uh, he was being considered for like chief technologist or something <laughs> or other. Um, so those those are um, in, really interesting things you can find in these files. Yeah. Any? Okay. Do you have a <laughs> a person you can't wait to get a privacy waiver from? <laughs> well, I think probably. I'm having trouble thinking of a specific person, but I think um, any politician or maybe 
uh, a documentary filmmaker. Yeah, a journalist with uh, Laura Poitras. Uh, I can only imagine Laura Poitras and uh, and Glenn Greenwald. Any, oh, any, wow. any of the journalists who have been involved in the major major leak cases, um, Pentagon Papers folk, Daniel Ellsberg, a lot of, the, a lot of those people. Um, I feel so weird being so, <laughs> you're being like, so yes. eager and like wide-eyed, but um, you know those FBI files, they, um, they'll take up a lot of space on the vault, <laughs> so if we're still using servers at that point. <laughs> um, so John Stewart, if you were watching, um, please give me your permission because I do not want to wait for you to die. Um, <laughs> which is a perfect way to close this out. Yeah. Um, so thank you for joining us again, uh, and uh, thanks Nicole for being our first special guest. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see you next week. I feel like we need fade out music now. Ah, you know? oh, that's our next. That's there our next go. production value. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's trademarked, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get banned from YouTube.